Hi, good morning, everyone. It's Jonathan with NWRA. We're just going to give it another minute before we kick things off. I'll let people all file in. Good morning, everybody. Mal, are you there? I'm here. Nice. Excited? Excited. It's a gorgeous day. 70 degrees here today. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. It's uh, And I'm getting a bunch of texts from people who are on. So thank you, everybody, for joining. I appreciate it. It's going to be a fun day. I've got some interesting things to discuss. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Mallory Schapansky. I'm the Vice President of Member Relations and Publications at NWRA, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So a few notes before we begin. If you have a question during the webinar, just be sure to type that into the chat box at any time, and I will relay those questions to Ryan. Your audio lines have been muted, so be sure to use your chat box. Um, also, at the end of the webinar, there will be a short four-question survey to complete, so your participation is encouraged as it helps us identify future topics for webinars. Um, and lastly, after the webinar is complete, you will receive a recording of the presentation in your email. So today's speaker is Ryan Vogelman. He is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Fire Rover. He's focused on bringing innovative safety solutions to market. And two of his solutions have won the Distinguished Edison Innovation Award for industrial safety in consumer products. He's been compiling and publishing the reported waste and recycling facility fires in the US and Canada since February 2016. And of course, the Waste and Recycling Facility Fires Annual Report, which we'll be discussing today. Ryan also speaks regularly on the topic of the scope of fire problems facing waste and recycling industries, detection solutions, proper fire planning, and early stage risk fire risk mitigation. Additionally, he is on the National Fire Protection Association's Technical Committee for Hazard Materials. So now I'll turn things over to Ryan to start his presentation. Thanks, Mallory. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. I appreciate it. I know this is uh, hopefully we're getting to, you know, the end of doing everything virtually. Um, and, you know, so I can tell you, I started, um, you know, consolidating the reported fires and waste and recycling facilities um, in 2016. Um, and again, I probably should have shared these slides, but there you go. Um, but basically, this is these are the numbers since 2016 of February. And again, I think you know the goal of today was really to talk through the annual report. This is the fourth one that I've put together. Um, you know, and, and I do get some help with it, so I appreciate everybody who's helped. Um, but really, I, I think you know the idea is we we've hit about five years. And you know, if we look at the industry um, and we look at how we're dealing with fires, you know, you could start to break it down into different types of materials and then different types of uh, and, you know, and, and how we're handling them differently in different type, the different occupancies in the industry. So, you know, the one thing that I will say has has shocked me, right? I mean, I think 2018, and you know, we'll get into this a little bit more, but in 2018, we all saw lithium-ion batteries, right? You know, we've been dealing with traditional hazards for years and years. Um, in 2018, we really saw, and I say when we, I'm talking globally, we really saw 
um, an uptick in fire incidences in the U.S. and Canada and also globally, um, you know, due to lithium ion batteries. That threat has not gone away. In theory or in, in reality, that threat has gotten worse. Um, the two years after 18, we, we started doing a little bit better. Um, and again, you know, last year was a pandemic year. So I think, you know, we saw a, like the tonnage move from a more office oriented commercial um, grade of, of tonnage to, um, you know, more of curbside. And, you know, as everybody was, was at their homes, um, we started to see kind of that fourth quarter um, typical um, fulfillment type of packaging, right? Um, get into our recycling and waste streams. Um, and that lasted for the year, but you know, it's one of those that this year, like, I don't really want to focus on what happened last year. I want to focus on the last five years because, you know, I think I, I'm thinking that last year was an aberration in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, as we look at the numbers in this year, in January, you know, I mean, we were kind of third, this is 18, this is 19 in January, we had about 20 fires and it's pretty similar in February, but in March of this year, I mean, we saw 30 two fire incidences. So it was the second highest since 18. And again, you know, we were at about 24 and, uh, you know, 23 in um, the year, or sorry, and, and like 17 in, in March of last year, where a lot of our facilities had shut down. Um, you know, so we did see an uptick. Well, the first 13 days of this month, I've been tracking and we're literally at 23 fires and seven injuries to firefighters in the first 13 days of this month. So again, I don't know if it's due to heat and other factors, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But, you know, again, it's it's very clear that for the last year, a lot of people were focused on safety of your employees, um, you know, and, and, and that's important, right? I mean, this is definitely a safety perspective. But really, when you look at it, I mean, you know, we really got to remain diligent and move back to where we were. Um, when 18 scared us and, you know, 19 and 20, we really focused on uh, fire prevention and, and risk mitigation. Um, so, you know, th th these are the numbers from the past five years. You know, we average about 318 reported fires. And again, for those of you who have never seen my um, reports before, I, I classify a reported fire as a fire that's been reported by a media outlet. And the reason I do that is because typically those are the two alarm, three alarm, four alarm fires. Those are the fires that have an effect to the media um, or the effect to the public, which allows the media to actually report them. Um, I believe that there's like six times that amount. And I use that based on assumptions typically from or traditionally from the UK. But I've I've been able to to, um, you know, to justify those numbers based on actual insurance claims um, and uh, some others. Now, when you look at it, when I first started with Fire Rover, you know, I mean, it's it's an innovative product. I thought it was great. You know, we were selling a fire protection product. What I've realized over the past five years is that we're selling an insurance product, right? It really is a risk mitigation product from an insurance perspective and from an operator perspective. Typically, executives are who we're having the conversations with on, you know, it's it's a safety brings us in and the executives are looking at it from an insurance perspective. So, you know, there's a lot of good news that's happening on that front. I think, you know, in 18, we saw a lot of um, insurance companies run from the industry. Um, I've been working hard since that time trying to bring, you know, trying to show that, you know, we have a solution that will allow risk mitigation for individual sites. And, you know, again, in our 200 sites that we that we protect, um, and I started sharing the fires last year that we put out, but we've had less than 10 that have needed a fire department um, to show up in the past five years. We've had less than two that were catastrophic, and those both had incident like they both had um, incidences that could be explained away. It wasn't our system that was the that was the problem. I mean, one fire started behind a box, and another fire started from an operator perspective. They had they had uh, piles that were a little bit too high. So again, it's one of those things that you know, there is a way to mitigate this risk. And I do understand that a lot of the focus in this industry, as you'll hear, a lot of these bills that are coming out through public are coming in and, you know, they're all talking about education. And again, education is extremely important, but we really need to make sure that we don't forget to fund grants and loans towards the fire professionals who are fighting these, that they have the proper equipment, and then also to have the proper technology inside our facilities to ensure that we don't have these types of fires. Um, so this was the the number last year, as I was mentioning, I started sharing the the client saves. And again, there's a number of different number of different definitions, but basically the client saves is when we see flames and we put a flame out, right? It's considered a save for us. Um, last year we had 207. This year so far we're at like 45 or 50. 
Um, and as we continue to add in um, sites, I mean, we're putting in probably about five or six sites a month. Um, as we continue to add those in, we're going to hopefully have more and more saves, right? These are the, Republic, the publicly reported fires. Our goal is for that number to start going down. Again, I never expected 2021 to actually increase, but it, you know we're going to learn what, what's what's happening because right now we're kind of on trend, you know, to actually to beat this number. And then with that, when you put those together, you get your total known fire incidences. And then at the end of the day, the goal is how many total fires do we think that we're going to see reasonably? And again, it's not about the number of fires that you have. It's about the severity of fires. So yes, you want to have less fires. Good operators have less fires than bad operators. But really, you know, the, the important is what's the severity of the fire and, and, and how do you react to your fires? Um, you know, with this, I've broken out by material or by, um, by, by occupancy. And really, if you look at waste paper and plastic, that is our household hazardous, you know, our household recycling and our household non-hazardous recycling Plus, it's um, it's our it's our waste stream. So it makes up about 49%. I'm going to get into you know a number you were probably on the Unomia presentation that happened a couple of weeks back. Um, they did some great um, you know some great data um, and some great analysis, really trying to understand number one the types of fires, the materials that were causing those fires, and the actual cost. And again, we could never really put a number to it, and Unomia has allowed us to put a number. And you know, it's it's basically like 1.2 billion dollars in the U.S. and Canada are operators, which in turn is the insurance companies and the firefighters, um, the fire departments are the ones that have had 1.2 billion dollars in in uh, cost. And I, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But really, when you look at it, 49% of our fires are made up from basically household you know waste and then traditional paper plastic recycling. Um, from a scrap metal perspective, um, this is unique in the sense that, you know, we're seeing fires increase here last year over 19. Um, and, you know, we're seeing 32% of our reported incidences are happening in scrap metal facilities. And if you look in, in the Europe, it's about 18%. So it's one of those that we need to understand why we are in theory having more fires in scrap metal facilities. And again, we break it out into organics and chemicals. Chemicals is a hazard material. Um, you know, we, we, we do protect a number of those facilities and those are a little bit different. Typically those aren't, um, you know, those are more processing versus, um, you know, versus danger, right? So, you know, typically it's, you have to heat up the, 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 the chemical to, um, you know, to recycle it. So, you know, there's dangers in those. Uh, construction and demolition, a lot of these fires are actually inside the waste paper and plastic because in the reporting, you know, they call a trash facility a trash facility a trash facility. Um, so really, you know, that number is a little bit low, um, rubber specific, and then e-scrap, this is really growing, right? We're seeing ton and ton of, um, of more facilities that are, um, you know, doing electronic scrap for portable electronics and for personal electronics. And you know w w this is uh, I would say it's a very um, it's, it's a very like immature industry. There are some really good players in it um, that are providing a lot of leadership like ERI out there, but you know there's also a number of, of smaller guys that are really just you know um, opening up and you know they're giving you know somewhat of a bad name. But when you look at it, I mean we had four fires in 2020 alone that were e-scrap fires. So I do believe that this number is going to grow over the next few years. Um, if we look at, you know, EREP is putting together, um, you know, an assessment of fires at recycling and scrap facilities. Um, phase two just came out. So I would definitely say that if you, uh, if you are an operator and you haven't responded to this, I, you know, they're definitely looking um, for response. But, you know, again, I think what we're saying is that 75% of respondents reporting a fire in the last year. I mean, we're seeing fires all the time. There is an inherent risk of fire in our industry. And again, that, that's not a bad thing, right? And if we, we put our insurance hat on, you know, let's understand that like there's a lot, of, a lot of occupancies out there that have an inherent risk of fire in their normal course of business. They just have to have the protections to ensure that you know, they're not having significant losses or catastrophic losses that the insurance companies are, you know, that, that scares them. Um, this is what I was talking about before, Unomia. Um, this is the waste fires and, you know, these are the facility types in England versus us, right? This is the waste transfer stations, which is about 40%. And this is the, uh, this is basically the recycling piece of it. Um, and then again, metal recycling is about 18%, where ours is 32. You know, theirs are about 49% where we make those up. 
treatment recoveries, a little bit of the uh, chemicals as well. Their composting is organic, you know. So again, I, I think it's it's important that we look and you know that when I'm reporting these fires, I'm trying to do it in a way that everybody understands and that the definitions are clear. Um, so what's causing the fires? And, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time getting into what's causing them. I mean, I think we know lithium ion batteries. Basically, you know me has said it's one out of every two. I think the report from EREF said that it was like higher than that. And there's been other studies from the, um, you know, from a couple other associations that have said that that number could be as high as 67, you know, percent. Um, I really think at the end of the day, traditional fire hazards are your main hazard, right? Those are the aerosol cans, your butane, your chemicals, you know, hot ashes, paint, fireworks. And, you know, I think when you look at traditional hazards, typically those can be pre-sorted out of the equation. So when you're looking at a prevention perspective, there are, you know, your company can slow down processing or add processing or do certain things to try to pull these, these um, you know, types of hazards out of the stream. And I think we can educate around a ton of these, right? Let the public know that, hey, you shouldn't put fireworks after the 4th of July or hot briquettes into, you know, a recycling bin or into your waste bin. You know, don't put paint and, you know, chemicals or pool chemicals in, you know, these are something that, that you know, we can do everything we can on the front end to really we stop them from happening. Lithium ion batteries, the problem with them, and again, they make up the other half, you know, those issues are, you know, these things are in every single piece of equipment and you have no idea where they are, right? So yes, it might be clear that batteries are inside, you know, a, a, a toy, you know, when you have an Apple iPhone that comes through, yeah, it's clear, there's a, there's a battery in there, you can't just remove it. But when you have something like a greeting card or a T-shirt or, you know, like they have LED balloons, you know, that, um, you, you know, run by lithium batteries. So, I mean, they're literally in everything and they're hard to pre-sort. So we're finding them at the end of scrap metal lines. We're finding them in screens in MRFs. You know, we're finding them exploding, you know, in on uh, tip floors. So, I mean, that hazard is, it's, and it, the, the issue is this is, and again, I, I, put numbers in together, but there's any number you look at, the number of lithium ion battery fires is going up. Um, or the, the number of battery, um, you know, number of batteries getting into the system from an end of life perspective is going up. So, you know, it's, this is a hazard we're gonna be dealing with. And even if somebody comes up with a different type of, you know, non-fire hazard or, or safe lithium ion battery or safe battery, I mean, again, th this is commercialized and it's in the system. So, you know, even if today we we found out this this Eureka miracle, I mean, for us to get everything out of the system would take years. And, you know, that's obviously not happening. Um, heat and dry environments definitely is a cause. And we can see the correlation from, um, you know, Florida during the summer and Florida during the winter. We actually have more fires in Florida during the winter because it's drier um, and, you know, Again, hot environments during the summer, we see a summertime spike. And again, I would say probably in April of this year, you know, if we look at the first 13 days, it was relatively hot across, you know, a lot of different municipal or a lot of different territories. So I would say that that's probably one of the causes, but, you know, it, it, it can't be the only, right? It's, it's an environmental factor that will, you know, will make things a little bit more dangerous. Um, I think inherent risk, right? I mean, there is an inherent risk of, of fires in a lot of the types of, uh, you know, occupancies that we're doing. Again, hazardous materials is just an inherent risk of, you know, those being able to, um, you know, become unstable if they're, if they're not handled 100% properly. Uh, we do see a lot of sparks and hot works. And again, you know, education works on a lot of these. And also arson is something I don't like to bring up, but it is a reality and it does happen. So, you know, some of these times, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, I don't want to, point any fingers, but it's definitely um, an issue. So if we, we start to get into what Unomia has basically said, you know, they're looking at the total number of reported fires and how many were based on lithium. And really that's, that gets you to your 50%. Um, this is the Jap, Japan, or the Japan Containers and Packaging Association. This had the numbers in 2018, you know, was this in Australia and others, you know, had this increase as well. Um, and again, I also have broken it out by materials processed. Th these are all like all these different um, data points and analysis are inside the annual report if you haven't read it. Um, and if you have more questions, I'm happy to get into those. Um, but, you know, a couple of these slides that I really want to focus on. I mean, this is our Fire Rover client installation. 72% uh, are waste paper and plastic. And again, it's it's really the, the C and D is about 12%. C and D actually makes up more than than 12%. 
Um, we do have customers that we classify them into one area. So if you have C&D and MRFs and, and transfer stations, they probably or more than likely get thrown into waste paper and plastic. Um, scrap metals about 8%. And again, we have a lower number of scrap metal fires, but if you look at our incidences, we're seeing a higher number of fires at scrap metal facilities than we do from our incident perspective. Um, C and D is about, you know, even chemicals are definitely, uh, I mean, when we're dealing with chemicals, we have less fires, but when we have a fire, they're, they're more dangerous. Um, you know, but again, I think that just, you know, gives a little bit of an idea um, of, you know, how the industry has really looked at, you know, trying to mitigate risk and trying to ensure that the proper prevention ha is happening. Um, and, you know, technology and innovation is, is being brought in, not just, you know, traditional fire tactics um, that have been around for a long time. Um, you know, and I do get into some of this other data by state. You know, I don't want to go into specific states here, but, you know, you can look at how your state's doing. Um, as compared to the reported fires versus your annual fires per year. I've also broken it down by materials in each state. So, you know, the highest reported, if you, you know, you, you can tell like, you know, which, um, you know, which areas have like from an organics fire perspective, obviously Florida and California have a lot more organics processing. A lot of other states don't have it or provinces don't have that. Um, you know, and then I also break it out by um, states by reported fire incidences and the reasonable population assumption, and then I'll do by tons per incident reported. So how your state in theory is doing, um, you know, per number of facilities, and those number of facilities came from EREF's um, data of, um, it was like 2013 data. So that number, you know, needs to be updated, and I'm, I'm honestly looking forward to the next time we can get some really good data on the number of facilities that are out there. So at this point, you know, that's really the scope of the problem. I mean, again, if you have questions, let me know. Um, really, we get into the consequences, right? And, you know, what are the problems? One of the big ones is, you know, continuity of business, right? Um, business interruption. So, again, it's not about the number of fires. You can have a fire if you put them out, you know, you can have 500 fires. If you put them out every day and you use a fire extinguisher and they're put out and everything's great, awesome, right? But it's really the severity of the fires. And, you know, Material uh, Recycling World actually put out a survey a couple years back. Um, and basically, 75% of the fires that were reported had length of disruption over one day. Um, now that's crazy, right? Because if you look at that, that, that means that there's cleanup and everything that goes with it. And I think, you know, to make it more apparent, right? Like the waste industry safety and health forum, which is basically EU's, like they, they brought experts together and they defined a, a an incident that is at a waste and recycling facility is a, a positive incident. If they have the fire under control contained and, you know, basically, under control within four hours, right? When I look at that and we say four hours, yeah, that makes sense with traditional fire tactics, but with early detection and others, like with our system, we focus on trying to get that fire in those initial 10 minutes, right? If, if a fire department arrives on scene, like that doesn't mean we didn't do our job. That means that it was a really big incident and I'll show you guys some videos um, as we go through this. So again, I think that's one piece. I think the others, I mean, this is all new data. Um, from Unomia and uh, from Europe. So, you know, if you look at it, I mean, basically most fires are a level three um, incident where basically they, they, they're between four and 24 hours, right? So if you look at that, um, four and 24 hours is, is a major um, amount of down, downtime for any processor out there or any operator who's on the phone. Um, so, you know, I think that's important. I think really when you look at that, what Unomia did, they broke this down into a cost per fire incident. And, you know, this is where I, I was tell, saying that $1.2 billion number, right? $1.2 billion is what the, um, you know, this is uh, in, in euros and also it's in, you know, population assumptions of that, that six times. So, you know, I still think that six times is a conservative number. But basically, the waste site operators are unfairly getting burden with this cost. And this is where, again, you look at that and then fire and rescue services is the other piece of it. So really at the end of the day, right, whether it's a volunteer fire department, whether it's an urban fire department, rural fire department, you know, you, you need to give them the proper equipment, A, to fight these fires, right? And B, you know, you need to help the operators do things that are more than just fire prevention, 
right? Because at the end of the day, if the manufacturers are developing a, uh, you know, all of these batteries and the major incidences and the major costs to these hazards are falling on waste operators, you know, we're creating an unhealthy balance for the industry. And, you know, there's a, there, there's a, there's a proposal going through in California um, where, you know, they're doing a reverse deposit program. So the whole idea is that you're going to have, you know, for every, for every pound of lithium ion batteries that a manufacturer puts into the California market, they're gonna to have to pay a dollar, right? And that dollar is all being earmarked for education. And again, I'm not saying that education is not important. It's definitely important, but well, you know, why wouldn't 20% of that money go to firefighters and to technology that can allow our MRF operators to operate safely and ensure that they're in business? So. Again, you know, this was really an eye opener for me when you see it and you put it into a number perspective, right? Like this is not a problem that is being deliberately caused by anyone, but it, it does need a solution, you know, where everybody looks at it and all the main players and everybody takes responsibility for, you know, for, for their piece of this market. Um, you know, again, I think another thing from a consequences perspective is death and injuries. Um, most of the injuries that we see, like, and I learned this a long time ago, right? I mean, we don't have a ton of deaths that come from this. Um, slow down and get around and other campaigns um, have a lot more of an effect on, you know, why we've moved from five to six um, in a positive direction on, uh, you know, the most dangerous occupancies. Um, so, Again, you know, I, I get it. Most people don't die from this, you know, type of a hazard. So that's the greatest news ever. Um, but from an injury perspective, most of the injuries are to firefighters. So if you're seeing that, you know, and I said there were seven injuries in the first, you know, week and a half of this year, those were all to firefighters. And again, if a firefighter doesn't have to fight the fire, then they're not going to have those injuries. So it's a direct correlation. If we can stop a fire from happening early, we stop the fire department from having to come and respond and actually have to fight, which causes them heat exhaustion, heat stroke, all the different pieces. And then they, you know, they have physical injuries as well that are happening um, when they're on ladders and doing other things. So this is really important, right? I mean, you know, if the fire department doesn't have the right, the, the right um, you know, equipment, why don't we help fund them, right? Like with, uh, or and have the manufacturers step up and, you know, start to do things to actually help the, the real problem um, and, you know, where the real causes of injuries are occurring. So th this is where I was saying from an insurance perspective. And again, you know, I really consider m myself an insurance, like in the insurance industry, right? Um, you know, I think in the beginning, a lot, of, a lot of folks in the industry were asking, you know, why is Ryan out there telling everybody that there's all these fires? You know, he's basically going to scare away the insurers. Let me tell you, insurers aren't afraid of me, right? They could care less. Um, what they're looking at is actual claims data. And this is the top claims data from um, Nathan Bernard from the Insurance Office of America. This was my reported data versus his reported data of claims. And again, if my definition is a reported fire, that's typically a higher severity of a fire that a, a reporter is now notified of, then you know, Nathan's are actual claims with that were made, right? Small fire, no damage, no claim, insurance company has no insight to it. So, you know, when you look at the number, this is why in 16, everyone from an insurance perspective was leaving and we're at limited options now. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, I had a conversation with a company that manufacturer or that, that like insurers about 2000 waste and recycling companies. And, you know, it's like the shoe, the other shoe is about to drop because at a certain point, you know, there's, if you're looking at these hazards and they're seeing these hazards grow and their actuarials are looking at the data. And again, they're looking at actual claims data for the last five years and wondering why this is happening. Um, and, you know, wondering what they can do to ensure that their operators are putting in the right techniques prevention and, um, you know, and technology in place to stop these fires from happening. Because again, insurance companies, the, you know, they don't want to pay out claims. I'm not saying that they run from paying out claims, but, you know, it's a numbers game to them, right? So really, when you look at it, this was in 18 when, you know, this is actual five of the, in, in, the five of the insurance companies that left the industry. Um, this is the claims that happened. And again, in 18, you saw an increase in claims from shredders where we see a ton of fires. Right, lithium-ion battery specifically claims, hotspots, 
you know, we're seeing a ton in trucks and none of my data has anything to do with trucks or with um, landfills unless there's a, um, you know, unless there's a, a building or a, a facility operating on that landfill site that has a fire. So again, when we start looking at this, it's really how do we decrease the claims? And that's really how we're going to increase, um, you know, access to the industry. So really, you know, the major question that I've been looking at and really has hit me is how do we bring insurers back to the industry where there is an inherent risk of fire, right? And we need to find solutions on a portfolio basis, right? So, you know, I've been on a number of calls with my clients where, you know, we're basically talking to the insurers and showing them our safety record so that they understand that when they make an investment in our solution, yeah, there's no 100% guarantee that, you know, they're not going to have a fire or any incidences, but we, we bring them back to a, a level of risk that is before lithium ion batteries that allows a little bit of a comfort level, right? Um, so, you know, there are, and I, I've heard this and seen it, I mean, there are guys who aren't getting insurance or they're getting increases that are, you know, basically like assuming that they have no fire sprinklers at all, even when they have sprinklers. So, you know, I'm sure there's, um, you know, every situation is a little bit different, um, a little bit unique, but really the idea is how do you mitigate your risk? And by doing that, how do we, um, you know, how do, how do we do that at a site level and also at a portfolio level? Hey, Ryan, I think we lost your audio. Good operators are going to have less fires than bad operators, right? There's just, there's no question. Um, but with that being said, you know, the professional response needs to be properly educated on your site, you know, like firefighters don't want to go into a facility that's constantly changing from an environment perspective. So, you know, from a professional response perspective, making sure that they understand your site, they understand your layout, they understand everything that you, that you do and the materials you process so they can prepare themselves, gives them a comfort level actually going and fight a fire with you. Um, and again, so really these two are very intertwined. Um, and I think really at the end of the day, I think the real opportunity is the internal response. Right. Most people or most operators will say that they do not have a fire brigade, um, you know, but their employees are on the front lines fighting, you know, the, the five out of six fires that happened that went out before there was ever damage or any issue. So really, the idea is, OK, how do we focus on that time frame and how do we take that time frame to about 10 minutes? Right. So how fast can we detect it? How fast can we get the firefighters on on site? And then what do we do during that time to fight it? And we look at, it's typically about 10 to 15 minutes before the fire department gets on scene. Um, so we focus on those 10 minutes. And then we also focus on trying to set that tripwire as earlier in the process as possible. So really it's not whether you're gonna have an incident, it's we do not wanna have a major fire incident. We see all these types of fires in our, in our you know, solutions that are in our daily interactions with our customers. But as long as we can prevent it from, or as long as we can, you know, put the right type of environmentally friendly cooling agent on it fast enough, or we can catch it before there's a flame, which we do a lot in like ASR piles. Um, and, you know, there, there's um, rubber fire, uh, like rubber fires where you can see a heat abnormality where we can spray it before, um, you know, this is where the real opportunity is to, uh, you know, to, to, to make a, a major difference. And again, everybody has a rule, whatever firefighter you talk to, has a rule, you know, a fire grows in size and cost every 30 seconds, every minute, whatever they say, right? But it is true. And especially when you're dealing with a lithium ion battery hazard, the lithium ion battery specific hazards, and we have some lithium ion battery only solutions where, um, you know, we've replaced sprinkler systems uh, from a jurisdictional perspective, because what ends up happening is that like firefighters in theory cannot go in and fight fires anymore that are in lithium ion battery facilities. There was uh, like, there was eight injuries or, uh, you know, in uh, surprise Arizona in a storage facility. And uh, you know, so, so basically they've been told to take a defensive approach. So we've developed a solution that allows our system to shoot for six to eight minutes with an environmental friendly cooling agent. And what we do is, is that 
if you get to the fire early, if you get it to before there's thermal runaway, you actually have a shot. Once thermal runaway occurs in a, in a battery, um, I mean, you, you, you either have to soak it to a point or you have to allow the oxygen to run away. So if you have a building with pallets and, you know, 15, um, you know, different types of lithium ion battery inside and, you know, you have all these EV batteries, you can imagine how bad it can get and how fast it can get bad. So really, if you don't catch it early, you, you, you really have to just say, hey, it's a loss. It's a complete, you know, it's, it's a catastrophic loss that we're going to lose the entire facility. So, you know, again, that's a problem from an insurance perspective, from a business continuity perspective um, and all the different pieces. So we've developed a quick connect that goes on the back of these facilities. So we'll shoot for six to eight minutes and then the fire department comes in and they will connect to, you know, to allow us to shoot for 45 minutes and then allows us to, to meet the requirements of a sprinkler system. So really what we do is, I mean, we have a 20 by eight by eight container. Um, it just needs internet and electricity. If you're doing an outdoor application, it's uh, about 22 foot mast. Um, indoor application, you can see, um, basically we pipe these in. So, you know, if you think of a sprinkler system inside a 40 foot building with line of sight, right? It, the, the heads have to be so high that the radiant temperature needs to be 180 degrees to really heat it so that it'll release the water. So unfortunately, you know, a lot of our fires, we'll catch them early enough because we're looking at direct heat of 220 in a pixel. And I'll show you guys some videos of that. But really the idea is we'll spray it and go off. Most of the time, you know, we are in facilities that have sprinkler systems. Most of the time, the sprinkler systems don't go off. Um, you know, or the fire department gets there and we'll start fighting it before the sprinkler systems go off. And I'll show you guys some examples of that. Um, but basically, um, you know, from an adoption perspective, because this is always the question, uh, we are working hard on FM approval. We have just been classified as a, uh, a smart monitor. So the first smart monitor, um, which ironically pulls a human being and a brain back into, um, you know, to the technology, which allows us to, um, you know, to, to um, you know, to really be that smart technology. And then on top of that, you know, we are working hard to get our language into NFPA code. As long as we meet or exceed the requirements um, with our solutions that, you know, the code requires, you know, we can do it in a better way or a different way. Um, so again, you know, we've, we've had luck. We've been written in, um, you know, we've been written in the uh, construction and demolition um, appendix. And, you know, so we're, we're doing everything that we can to, uh, you know, to get in the 409, which is uh, the hangar protection um, and others. So, you know, you know, within a company that's been around seven years, for us to be adopted as fast as we have in, in the, uh, you know, from an NFPA perspective, it really shows that, you know, this isn't a, a flash in the pan, right? This is a solution that's been around for, you know, six years, seven years at this point, and has been tried, tested, and proven. And, you know, we, we, you know, what we say we can do, we've done, and, you know, we're doing for eight of the top 10 waste and recycling companies in the country. Um, so we use an environmentally friendly cooling, uh, like a cooling agent. It's an encapsulator agent. We're agnostic on the types of foams we use, but I'm sure you guys have all heard of PFAS issue. Uh, we stopped using PFAS in 16 um, because, you know, we knew that the writing was on the wall. Um, so, you know, we moved to an encapsulator agent for two reasons. One was PFOS issues. The other one was that, you know, from a lithium ion battery perspective, if you use an A3, like three triple F foam on a lithium ion battery fire, you can soak it, right? And that can work. But what ends up happening is, is that the foam will, it, the, 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 um, the, the battery will continue to create oxygen. So all it'll do, you'll see the foam bubble up because the fire is actually inside of it. Um, with their encapsulator agent, what we found is that it's, it, it does a reverse polarity around the water molecule. So it doesn't steam off the way that foam would. And so we find that on class D fires, especially lithium ion battery fires, we find that it works best, but we are agnostic and we could use any type of material or just water. Um, we do boxless solutions now. Um, you know, where we just have our cannons and our, uh, you know, and our, and our thermal monitoring and our maintenance and our warranty all together, where we just use, it's basically a targeted to lose system where we can continuously spray towards hotspots versus the alternative of these manual monitors where, you know, when a facility fills with smoke and you think that you know where the fire is, you're looking towards it and you might shoot that monitor and then you evacuate the building. 
but we actually can shoot through smoke, heat, and darkness, um, you know, to uh, put a fire out. So, you know, I think, you know, I do have videos that I'm going to walk through a couple, and then again, I'll open it up to questions in the meantime. So, if there are any questions, please feel free. We can, you know, spend the last 15 minutes kind of walking through those, and I'm happy to stay on after if uh, I haven't bored you all to death, you know, to this point. But let me walk through like two videos or three videos, and then we can, you know, we can go through. And if you have questions, we can, we can, uh, you know, I can show other videos if it, it it responds to the questions. But like this is a traditional tip floor. And again, like our like sprinkler systems are amazing, right? I, I, they they work in commercial buildings, office buildings, homes. But when you're when you have a building that has a 40 foot ceiling, industrial size, that you know where we have line of sight, this is where our solution really works well. And so what we're doing is we're using the top grade thermal camera. Here there was a fire in the metering drum, and then embers came out and started a fire in the uh, material pile, right? We see this. A human being is looking at it, is verifying it and then they're responding to it. So again, one of our trained agents who's remotely located at one of our four facilities, it's either Pennsylvania, Texas, Nevada, or California, they are there with a joystick and they are responding to your fires. And again, like if you look at the number of incidences they deal with on a daily basis, a lot of these, these pieces of equipment that have come out where they say, hey, we used AI and you know, we don't have a brain and you know we're like what they end up doing is they can look for a fire start shooting number one they're not going to stop if there's a human so if we see a human we know to stop right now again a human won't get killed getting hit by our water i mean it's about 60 uh it shoots out at 150 but it's about 60 um it's about 60 um pounds per pressure or, um it's, it's 60 gallons per minute when we're when we're shooting a, a distance and again there's an arc and all the other things that happen with it but you know with that being said we have a human being who's looking at it, verifying it, and then they're aiming this. And this, you know, it, it, we, we, we typically have a, a gun scope and another scope, um, like a, an, an HD camera, which is, you know, one of three that we'll have on top of the thermal camera. And we also have smoke analytics in this. So we see this, it goes back to our central station. They verify it, they look at it. Um, they do do a ton of false alarms in a day. And the reason we do that is because we set our temperature, the tripwire very early so that we can catch, think these are active locations. So we're catching forklifts and we're catching all these different pieces of activity that are normal. And most of the time our agents look at it and clear it and verify it, um, not all the time, but most of the time they're verifying these fires. So in here, you're basically, they're charging the unit. Um, and then on top of charging the unit, they, will use their their camera and their joystick and they're literally putting out these fires um if you can see in the middle of smoke in the middle of heat we're using this is our thermal camera right because we can't see with our hd cameras we'll spray one side we'll spray the next side and we're out so again most of the time you know and we will come in and we'll maintain these um a, an alarm goes off to you know to let you, you know, your your team know what's happening but really there's very limited training that your team needs to work on. Um, and again, we put these out, we probably have 85% left of our tank here. Once it's at 70%, we'll come in and fight it. Um, you know, and just to be clear, if you guys could hold on. So if we look at like the cause of a fire, this is a, uh, a chemical facility, right? We're shooting towards the fifth pallet on this chemical facility, um, you know, and again, it really shows like the level of, of uh, shows the level of, of um, precision that we can hit. And again, we've let the fire department know, or we've let the fire brigade know what's going on. Um, again, they're there, they're holding back. They're actually on the phone with us. Um, we will shoot this with our environmentally friendly cooling agent. We shoot it. We're gonna cool the, the hot spot, And then, I mean, this was a mislabeled chemical. They're gonna pull this out and they're gonna take it um, from a forklift perspective. You know, they can take it out without it having a domino effect. So, you know, I don't know, are, Mallory, are there any questions or did we wanna go into, um, did you want me to keep going through in videos? I have a few questions, but we got about 15 oh, minutes. So if you wanna finish your videos. Feel free. Yeah, I mean, and we uh, like I, I'll, I can play them as we go, and if we have questions, that works. But yeah, let's uh, let's get into some questions. Make sure we have enough time.
Okay, let me just pull them up real quick. Um, so the first one is at you know the top of the webinar. You mentioned that you know in the first 13 days of the month, um, I think it was you know 23 fires and seven injuries. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know why do you think that is, and what precautions can operators take to prep for the summer months when we typically see you know that spike in fires? Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, I think there's a lot of like fire engineers that will look at it from a tactical perspective, right? I mean, you know, you need to have, it's 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 almost not rocket science, right? You have to make sure your piles are low enough. You have to make sure that you have clearance in between piles. Um, you know, Jim Emerson from Star Industry Tech and I put together the 14, um, you know, the 14 waste and recycling tactics that are actually inside this report. So, you know, the, the idea that, um, good prevention tactics. I mean, you know, it's not really reinventing the wheel, right? Um, and again, I mean, I would say thermal cameras, understanding where the detection and where the hotspots are, um, you know, are, I mean, that's where the game changer is, right? Um, you know, so the, uh, like ISRI is, is, has come out with a, a prevention, um, you know, a, a series of tactics from a fire prevention perspective from experts. And again, you know, there are certain things that the experts will tell you to do and you need to follow those, right? Um, you know, I, I, I do think that one of the things that are important, if you're not gonna get into like thermal and, um, you know, so like solutions like ours, is preparing for the fire department to arrive on scene. So ensuring that you have a, uh, that you have a, fire, um, a fire hose, um, you know, with a Lancer nozzle in, um, that you understand that, you know, and one of the big things that we see, and, you know, I'll show you, th th this is a fire event that occurred um, this is a C and D facility, but a lot of our, a lot of the loader operators believe that they can grab a fire and pull it outside and mitigate it, right? But again, that doesn't necessarily happen because eight out of ten times it might work. But when you're dealing with a deep-seated fire, what you're supposed to do is pre-wet it, then pull away a layer, pre-wet it, pull away a layer. You know, this operator in here is going to go right in. There was an accelerant, and it was actually oak chips. Um, and it causes a major issue. Now, again, there were no damage and there was no, I mean, they did have cleanup in this situation. Um, and, you know, I'll show you, I mean, we literally fought this fire until the fire department arrived on scene. Um, most of the time, and again, I'll show you other videos where like a lithium ion battery, we'll literally put it out in 20 seconds and we won't have an issue. Um, but like you'll see in here, a fire extinguisher comes in um, at some point right there. Do you see that? So, you know, I, I think really understanding that, you know, if, if you have a solution that will allow you to spray water on it before you jump in versus just jumping in and adding oxygen to the fire and making it worse, um, you know, is definitely something that I, I see a lot of operators do. And we work with our customers on a daily basis to ensure, you know, after we have incidences that they are, are using the proper techniques from our perspective. Great, thank you. Um, and just in regard to insurance, and just so everybody knows, um, at Waste Expo, Ryan is also moderating a session on Wednesday morning that will talk more about you know, insurance related to this industry. So if you're at Waste Expo, make sure that you pre-register for that session. Um, but in regard to insurance, you know, how can the industry as a whole you know, kind of work together to get better insurance rates and to make our industry attractive to these insurers and kind of bring them back to our industry. Yeah, is that, that was a comment, not a question, right? Or no, I mean, like how, how can we work together to get Oh, yeah, 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 no. Well, okay, no, absolutely. And again, I mean, I think, I mean, there's a few different things, right? And I've seen my customers do this, um, you know, pretty successfully. There's, there's guys out there that, um, you know, the, like I call it insurance dating. But like the idea is this, is that put the best fire prevention tactics in place um, and then present yourself to a bunch of reinsurers, right? So, you know, I've been on a number of calls with, you know, Swiss Re and Aon and, um, you know, a lot of the big guys, Lords of London and all the others, um, you know, and, and again, like they're looking at your risk specifically. So at the end of the day, the insurance risk is a culmination of this specific site, right? You can always strategically break it down to that exact, like you're, what are you doing at your site to ensure you don't have fires? Because they're gonna look at your track record. They're gonna look at how many um, combustible incidents or how many um, catastrophic incidences you've had. 
And, you know, they're going to make sure that you're a good operator, right? And then, you know, the other things, and again, a lot of them are worried about trucks as well, um, you know, from a, um, you know, from a, an injury perspective, from a fire perspective, from, you know, so you really have to look at your entire portfolio of operations, trucks, you know, hauling equipment, um, you know, your processing equipment and facilities, and, you know, look at it more from a, um, from a casualty and a property perspective. And there's some good guys out there. I mean, Cotting and Butler does a great job. You know, I've been trying to get them in, back into the industry to try to help us, um, you know, and, and they do a really good job working with our clients to try to help them. Um, but I, I can tell you that there are insurance companies out there that now are like, won't take a, uh, you know, won't take claims unless they have a solution like ours in it. Um, and again, you know, so some sort of thermo, some sort of like automated response or, you know, um, you know, some type of response outside of the traditional fire planning tactics. Um, but again, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we just need to prove to them that we're not going to have fires. Right. And, you know, again, I believe that there's inherent risk of fire in what we do. So um, just to be clear on this video that you guys just saw, you know, the fire department gets there at the end. I mean, again, there was no damage. I mean, we shot for six to eight minutes, um, you know, and I think this is one of those things that as we, as we move to, um, as we move to, you know, a normal lithium ion battery fire. I mean, this is normal in, in facilities, right? Where we catch it early, you know, you'll see a lithium ion battery explodes right there in the pile. We're going to shoot at it. We're going to hit it. We're going to cool it. And, you know, we use 1% of our tank and then, you know, you're back to work. Um, this was at night. So, you know, we'll send a video in the morning and, and, and talk about it with our customer the next day. But, you know, I mean, these are the types of things. It's like, you know, how do you guarantee that doesn't happen? I mean, your guess is as good as my guess, right? I mean, the, their piles are, are properly laid. You know, they're, they're doing everything right. I mean, from a fire prevention perspective that I can see. So really the idea is like, you know, how else could you guarantee that that doesn't turn into a major incident? And again, if this thing has a chance, you know, before you're going to have that radiant temperature all the way up to the top, um, you know, it could be a, a massive fire. Thanks. Um, I have about five more questions for you, Ryan. Perfect. That just oh, awesome. Um, the first one I can answer. Someone asked if there's going to be, you know, a copy of the presentation available. Yeah, so we'll send out a copy of the video um, following this, and then I think Ryan's putting together his presentation and a PDF as well to send out. Um, but Ryan, for you, someone asked, do you have data on particular residue materials and respective moisture to risks of smoldering types of fire events? So no, I don't. Um, you know, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think one of the hardest things that we see is, or that I see is trying to get a, trying to get information from a reported article. Right. And I know Susie's doing that, really trying to understand, um, you know, from the EREF perspective. And I see Jonathan shared the link for the uh, follow up survey, really trying to understand what is the cause. And, you know, it's, it's funny because so, so one of the videos that I'll show you guys is um, it's like about two years ago, three years ago, everyone started blaming every single fire on lithium ion batteries. So let me show you an example. I believe I have it here. Um, but, you know, it, th this was a forklift that backed up onto a material pile. And what ended up happening was, um, there, hold on, sorry. So what ended up happening in it was that, um, was this it? No, indoor MRF. So what ended up happening was it was caused by a forklift and the forklift drove away. Um, and it, it literally a half an hour later, we saw the fire. So, you know, and, and again, like, I mean, we, we had like, you know, we went through all video. There wasn't a, um, there, here, it's right here. So if, if you see this, like this happened at 430 on an afternoon in one of our facilities in Missouri. And so you'll see the forklift backs up onto loose paper. And again, in this facility, we're actually protecting the equipment. It's about $7 million worth of equipment. Um, and we do a ton of preemptive maintenance, like from, you know, looking at uh, metering drums and ensuring that there aren't fires. And if there are fires, we shut down the system so that the fire stays within the conveyor. But like in this one right here, we'll back up onto this and you'll see that they'll drive away. There is no, I mean, there is no major fire here, right? Now this was 40 minutes later, all of a sudden it, it like, 
I call it spontaneous combustion. I don't know. All I know is that it was a, a low enough temperature that we didn't see it. And, you know, it was under 220. And all of a sudden now it's a fire, right? And again, it's like, you look at that and most people, like a fire forensics guy is going to walk into a, a, a tip floor and say, hey, you had all these fires. Oh, here's a lithium ion battery. That's what caused it, right? Like, you know, most of the time you're not catching these. So at the end of the day, I can see them, um, you know, because we're on the front lines of a lot of these things, but I don't have the the data, you know, that will tell you that, you know, it's this many versus this many. I mean, I think a lot of it's conjecture. I mean, that's my, my goal. Now, again, do I know that it is traditional hazards and lithium ion battery? Yes. Do I think 50-50 is probably a fair number based on my experience? Absolutely. Um, do I think that number is going to go up on the lithium ion side? Probably, right? But I mean, I don't have anything further than that um, besides our videos that, you know, some of our clients allow them to share, some of our clients don't. Um, so I would, you know, you can go on YouTube and, you know, we'll post the ones that we're allowed to share. And I think there's a lot of learning that can happen from those. Great, thank you. Um, and what would you suggest to help rid the material of the personal helium balloon tanks? Um, someone said, you know, we see so many of these and loads and materials. Um, can more warnings be placed on canisters? Yeah, I mean, again, that's education, right? And I think there's like, that's not where, I mean, there's a number of, like, there's a number of associations and people and experts and consultants out there who, you know, all they do is talk about education and they're trying to educate. And I mean, again, I, it, I am never going to say one bad thing about education, right? The public needs to understand the hazards that they're, that they're providing to us. Um, but with that being said, it's like, I feel there's almost too much focus. And again, I don't mean too much focus on education because I don't think that a dollar should be taken away from education. I just think there's too much focus on education and not enough focus on action. Um, and the action, you know, again, is doing things that are going to prevent these fires. Um, this is an example of, uh, you know, a, uh, one of our boxless solutions, right? And it's like, you know, to your point, like canisters get into shredders all the time in scrap metal yards. Um, you know, it, it can happen. So, you know, from our perspective, if there's an explosion, don't have your employees as the fire brigade, let us fight a fire. And if we get hurt, it's not like, it's a, it's a robot, right? Like no one's there, you know, fighting these. So if there's an explosive risk in what you're doing, um, you know, we're at a lot of scrap metal facilities, um, you know, and, and, you know, not just the ones with shredders, because I mean, a lot of people say, Hey, I don't need you guys. I don't have a shredder. Well, and we've seen a number of, uh, of scrap metal facilities that we protect that, you know, they're basically clamp onto a gas tank and it literally explodes and there's a huge fire. And again, a lot of these guys, their solution has been to put a fire truck on scene. That's not bad. I'm not saying that's bad, but the problem is again, now it's a fire brigade. So it has to be okay with your insurance company that you're putting your employees on the front lines fighting your fires. Does that answer? Thanks. Yeah. Answers. And these next two, I'm going to kind of combine together because they're both in regard to the fire rover itself. Um, on the wedding agent, how many minutes of agent production do you have? And then after the six to eight minutes, is it only water thereafter? So, yeah, that's a great question. And that's why I was showing. So, so this is, uh, we did Marquette, which is like the rural MRF of the future, right? I think, we, you know, we're we see waste management and FCC and GFL have created MRFs of the future. Um, this was really a rural MRF of the future. And the reason I say that was a couple things. Number one, we, we got a variance in replace of a sprinkler system. Um, so fire rover in lieu of sprinkler system, because we, like in industrial setting um, with high ceilings and good visibility, we were able to develop a solution that, sorry, we were able to develop a solution that could work better or, or is the same as or better than a sprinkler system in this situation. Um, so we use two boxes, six cameras. We also have 4G backup in all of them, um, as well as there's a, a generator that the, the uh, company has put in. Um, and then we also have our CAF systems that are in here. So the CAF systems are, I mean, it's, it's a good thing for the fire department. And I'll show you guys after this. Um, what those do, but basically there are many fire rovers that you can control. So at least if you're going to fight a fire, make sure that you're fighting it. I'm having a hard time just working through this. Hold on one second. So the one thing when I was talking about before was the um, the fire sprinkler or the the quick connect from a uh, right here. 
So these are the quick connects. So what happens is our unit will shoot for six to eight minutes. Then the fire department will come and we develop this for lithium ion batteries so that they would never have to go inside, but it works for our sprinkler replacement. They connect and they can, we can now shoot for 42 minutes um, you know, of water. Now, again, we, when I say 42, we can shoot for as long as they have water and pressure. Uh, the pumper truck becomes the pump that pumps the water through and it, then it'll come out in these nozzles and we're still continuously going at it. Um, so, you know, I think that's a big piece. The other thing is the, um, the and actually that's the lithium ion battery facility that we're doing um, in lieu of a sprinkler system. This is our cap systems and it's filled with our cooling agent. Um, but again, this allows you, it's, it's a, a 60 gallon and you can shoot for four to six minutes and you can shoot, you know, 90 feet. So, you know, fire extinguishers were made for one purpose, right? They were made so that when you're running out of a hallway or a building, you can spray your way out, right? They were not made to put out fires, right? They weren't made to put out lithium ion battery fires. Like you saw what it does when you go to put a fire out. So at the end of the day, like, you know, we, we actually have um, five units of these, you know, um, we have uh, five units of, oh, I don't have it in here, sorry. Okay, but so we, we have five gallons of these, we have 10 gallons. Um, so, you know, again, it, it gives you guys the ability to properly fight the fire. Now, that's for your employees. Now, for firefighters, when they get on scene, if you have one of these ready to go, you know, they basically turn two nozzles. It's either compressed air or nitrogen. They turn two nozzles and now they're fighting a fire. So as some of the fire department is going in and laying out the hoses, connecting to, you know, the, um, you know, connecting to, you know, the water source and bringing it in, you know, they're able to start shooting with this. And again, if they're trained on that, they know it. The more they're trained, the better apt that they, they are coming in and actually fighting the fire for you and not only fighting it, but fighting it successfully. Okay, and just to follow up to that, the encapsulating agent, is that a gel? It is not a gel. So it is a, uh, it's basically like a soapy water. It's, it doesn't even foam the way the foam foams, but it, um, it, it basically, enca it encapsulate the water molecule. Um, you know, it's environmentally friendly, PF, like there's no um, fluorine in it. And, you know, they're great products. Again, like we use an F500, there's Fireball that is the foam. Um, that we use, we use, you know, there, there's a ton of different like names out there. Um, you know, from our perspective, it's like anything else. We use a FLIR camera from, you know, from, or we use a top grade thermal camera from FLIR. If somebody else has come in and created a better technology, we would move to that technology, right? The, our system gets better over time as we continue to, to uh, learn more. Um, and that's really what we're focusing on is trying to, you know, have the best prevention system out there. Um, so, you know, we don't tie ourselves from an exclusivity with anyone based on, you know, if something else comes out that's better, we're going to use what's best for our customers. Great. Thank you. And just one final question before we wrap it up. Um, someone asked, why does California have two times the amount of fires than any other state or province? It's a freaking great question. I think, I mean, I, I think twofold, right? One is, is that they're one fifth the size of our country. So, you know, when you look at it, I think, you know, for them to have that number, and I've never actually done the number, you know, to basically say, okay, why is California so high? I mean, I think, you know, I, I've been told a couple things, right? One is that, like, if you look at California versus Texas, okay, well, Texas, a couple things happen, right? Everything's spread out. So maybe you're not getting, and I'm, I'm trying to get back to that, to that one slide. Um, but it's uh, in Texas, you don't have the number of reported fires, where in California, you have a lot of people who want to report fires. Now, you know, their population density is higher. So I've kind of, I've heard that in the past of why Texas would have less. And it's not that they're having less fires. It's the fact that they're having, um, you know, it's the fact that, you know, like California is reporting them more. Um, but again, you know, it's... Uh, I have no clue. I mean, you know, I, I would assume it's just like anything else, right? Why does Ohio have more fires than anywhere else, right? I mean, we're not even, I mean, I live in Ohio. We're not even like, you know, I think we're like the, the 10th or 12th largest state from a population perspective. So why do we have more fires than anyone else? And honestly, like, it's a, it's a great question. Sorry. Thanks. I, 
do you have a question <laughs> that I can answer that I actually know in the, uh, that would be good for the final one, right? I mean, but anyways, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, well, thank you so much. You know, I think this was, you know, some great content today. Um, and obviously everybody, if you want access to the report, you can reach out to Ryan following this. Um, and it's also linked on his LinkedIn as well uh, to get more insight into kind of what we discussed today. Um, but thank you everybody so much for attending. Um, and just as a reminder, we will send out uh, the video of this uh, webinar afterwards. And then there's also a quick four question survey that we will send out. Um, so thank you again, everybody for attending and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, and if you want, I mean, I do have my QR code, so feel free to link in with me. And and the the report's actually on LinkedIn and uh, Waste Three Sixty as well. And uh, so, and I'm happy to send it out in a PDF format. Just let me know. Thank you, Mallory. We appreciate it as always. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. All right. <laughs> See you guys later.